Our scripture reading comes from the book of Romans, Romans chapter 4. We'll also look at Lord's Day 23 of the Heidelberg Catechism, Romans chapter 4 and Lord's Day 23. Romans chapter 4, beginning of verse 1, the word of the living God. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. <clears throat> Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he still was uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs of Faith is null, and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believed who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he has been told. So shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespass and raised for our justification. May God bless the reading of his word to us. Now, Lord's Day 23. I will read the question. Let us respond together with the answer. <clears throat> question 59. But how does it help you now that you believe all this? Answer. That I am righteous in Christ before God and an heir to life everlasting. Question 60. How are you righteous before God? Answer. Only by true faith in Jesus Christ. Even though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against all God's commandments, of never having kept any of them, and of still being inclined toward all evil. Nevertheless, without any merit of my own, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ, as if I had never sinned nor been a sinner and as if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. If only I accept this gift with a believing heart. Question 61, why do you say that through faith alone you are righteous? Answer, not because I please God by the worthiness of my faith, for only Christ's satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness are my righteousness before God. And I can receive this righteousness and make it mine in no other way than by faith alone. 
So we finished the portion of the Heidelberg Catechism that examines the Apostles' Creed. And rather than jump right into the section on the sacraments, the Catechism now has two Lord's Days basically covering justification and good works. So we'll look at these two Lord's Days and then enter into the section on the sacraments. Now, Question 59 basically asks, so what, to all that we have seen prior to this? And it tells us that if we believe all this, all this that has been expounded in the creed, then we have two benefits. First, we are righteous in Christ before God. And second, we are heirs to life everlasting. These are the two benefits of believing all that is contained in the Apostles' Creed. And then question 60 tells us how we are righteous before God. It addresses that first benefit from question 59. I am righteous in Christ before God. Question 60, how are you righteous before God? Expounding on that. But we don't really get an explanation on that second benefit from question 59. There's not an expansion on that in the Catechism. We do see, of course, in question 58, the end, uh, addressing the end of the creed, how does the article concerning life everlasting comfort you? Even as I already now experience in my heart the beginning of eternal joy, so after this life I will have perfect blessedness, such as no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart has ever imagined a blessedness in which to praise God eternally. So because we are righteous before God, <clears throat> we are heirs to everlasting life. And we will experience all of God's eternal blessings that we see in question 58. This inheritance can never be taken away. Jesus says in John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. So that is our great hope. We are heirs to life everlasting. And so if righteousness in Christ is the path to everlasting life, we have to ask, what is righteousness? <clears throat> what does that mean? Very simple. Righteousness is conformity to God's law. If someone conforms to God's law, he or she is righteous. If someone does not conform to God's law, he or she is unrighteous. He is sinful. <clears throat> sin, of course, is in two forms. Sin is transgression of God's law. Transgression is crossing a line. It must be antinomian. There's no line, so we can't cross it. <laughs> the line of God's law. We'll put him out. So here's the line, we cross the line. Transgression. But also we have sin as missing the mark. Here's the bullseye, we end up out here. Missing the mark. So transgression, crossing the line, missing the mark is the other half of sin. Two ways to sin. <clears throat> Lack of conformity to God's law or transgressing God's law. So that is righteousness. Perfect conformity to God's law. So what is the standard then of righteousness? If righteousness is conformity to God's law, is the standard mostly conforming to God's law? Does God grade on a curve? More often than not, we conform to God's law 51% of the time. Is this God's standard? Of course not. The standard is absolute perfection because God himself is the standard of righteousness. So his perfect character determines what is righteous. And the question is, how then do we meet that standard? And this is the doctrine of justification. This tells us how we can meet that standard, <clears throat> the doctrine of justification. Now, we Reformed Christians sometimes get accused of making too much of justification. That's all you guys want to talk about, justification. Don't you want to talk about it, something else? There's lots of other aspects to salvation. All you want to talk about is justification. And it's true. We don't want to overlook the other aspects of salvation. We speak of the ordo salutis. Salvation is not merely justification. Ordo salutis. Sounds like a character in Star Wars. Ordo salutis. You can kind of see the English. This is order of salvation. Ordo salutis. Fancy Latin term. Order of salvation. 
It's the logical ordering of the elements of our salvation. This is not chronological. It's logical. And so we have election. We have calling and regeneration. It's kind of one act. Now, there are various... Um, Forms of the Ordo Salutis, some people will regeneration. Some people will arrange it in uh, different ways, but this is generally the reformed rendering of the Ordo faith and repentance. Justification. We have adoption, sanctification, and glorification. This is a typical reformed understanding of the Ordo Salutis. Again, this is not chronological. This is logical. They don't all happen at once. When does election happen? Eternity past. So this is before time began. God elects us in Christ. Now, these things all happen simultaneously. Calling and regeneration, being born again, being made alive in Christ, faith and repentance, Justification, adoption, all happen in a moment. They're all simultaneous. Now, you might not be aware that these things are happening when they are happening to you. Most likely you're not. Oh, I feel myself being justified now. Probably not. And you certainly can't discern the individual elements. Even if you are aware that something is happening to you, you will not be able to distinguish Regeneration from faith and repentance. Okay, now I'm being regenerated. Now I have faith and repentance. It's not like that. It happens in an instant. We go from darkness to light in an instant. All of this happens by God's sovereign decree. And it happens really without us being aware exactly what's going on. And then sanctification, of course, is extended over a lifetime. We wish that we could be sanctified instantly, but that's not God's plan. And then, of course, glorification happens after death or after the return of Christ. Now, again, this is the reformed understanding of the Ordo Salutis, the order of salvation. A key difference is this element right here, calling and regeneration. Let me tell you, uh, Reformed theology in three words. Regeneration precedes faith. You cannot exercise faith if you are not made alive in Christ. You do not exercise faith, and then you are regenerated. Impossible. Dead men do not exercise faith. These three words distinguish us from Arminians or all others who don't believe in the sovereignty of God and salvation. God has to make us alive in Christ. Going from dead in our trespasses and sins to alive in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Then he grants us the gift of faith and repentance. Regeneration precedes faith. We could tattoo this on our bodies. It is so crucial to understanding the Christian life and the power of God in salvation. We see elements of the Ordo Salutis in Romans chapter 8, sometimes called the golden chain. Beginning in verse 28, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. 
for those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of God in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Those whom he predestined, he also called. You're seeing the order here. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. And then in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11, we also see some of the elements. Such were some of you, but you were washed. This refers to regeneration. So Paul says you were washed, you were regenerated, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now, each element in the Ordo Salutis, Ordo Salutis is crucial. We can't eliminate a single one and still have salvation. We can't take out election and still have regeneration, justification, and so forth. And each element guarantees the others. If you are elect, you will be regenerated. If you are regenerated, you will be granted faith and repentance. If you have faith and repentance, you will be justified. If you're justified, you will be adopted. If you have all these, you will be sanctified. We'll talk about that more in a minute. And of course, we will be glorified. You can't pull, this is not Jenga, where you can pull one out. The whole thing would collapse. Each element is crucial, and each element ensures the rest of the Ordo Salutis. So, of course, we don't want to minimize these other elements of the Ordo Salutis. This is all the doctrine of salvation. However, the article of justification, the doctrine of justification, is distinct. J.H. Alsted, a Reformed theologian from the 17th century, said the article of justification is said to be the article by which the church stands and falls. Now, often you'll hear that credited to Luther. Luther said similar things, but he didn't actually say that statement. So we want to credit our Reformed forefather, J.H. Alsted, the article by which the church stands and falls. Calvin said justification is the main hinge on which religion turns. So we want to be sure to get justification right. If we get this wrong, this affects our understanding of the entire Christian faith. Now, to understand the Protestant doctrine of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, of course, we should be acquainted with our friend Martin Luther. We can't really understand justification without knowing Luther and what was previously believed erroneously about the doctrine of justification. Prior to becoming Protestant, Luther got this doctrine very wrong, and it was ruining his life, and of course would have ruined his eternal soul had God not miraculously intervened. So in 1505, Luther enters the monastery at Erfurt, Germany. He becomes a member of the Augustinian order. Later in his life, he wrote, I was indeed a pious monk. I kept the rule of my order so strictly that I can say if ever a monk gained heaven through monkery, it should have been I. Monkery is a great uh, way to encapsulate that. I'm engaging in monkery. Uh, but he was a great monk. He really followed the rules of being a monk. They call it um, the order. This is their, their how many times you pray, how many times you read the Bible, etc., etc. They had this all, it's like the army. It's all laid out. And he really followed it. He said, all my monastic brethren who knew me will testify to this. I would have martyred myself to death with fasting, praying, reading, and other good works had I remained a monk much longer. So he really believed it. He really bought in. This is the way to being right with God. Not just going through the motions, unlike some of his fellow monks. Some guys who were in the monastery were just there to be there. In the medieval world, it was common, especially amongst the nobility, the firstborn basically takes over the family business. He's the landowner, the, the noble. Well, what do you do with your other sons now? Well, you send some to the army. You send some into the clergy. So some of these guys had no intention of being ministers or monks or priests, but their family pushes them into it. So they're not, they're just going through the motions. Luther's not like that. He really believes it. He really tried to live by it. 
Then in 1519, he's lecturing on the Psalms at the university, and while he's doing this, he's also reading through the book of Romans. And he comes to Romans chapter 1, verse 17. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, verse 16 and 17. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So this was the key for Luther prior to becoming Protestant, the righteousness of God from Romans 1.17. He said, up until then, it was not the cold blood about the heart, but a single word in chapter 1, verse 17. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed that had stood in my way. The righteousness of God stands in his way. For I hated that word, righteousness of God, which according to the use and custom of all the teachers I had been taught to understand philosophically, regarding the formal or active righteousness, as I called it, with which God is righteous and punishes the unrighteous sinner. So the righteousness of God, he believed, referred to God's perfect righteousness that he possesses in himself and that he demands from the sinner. That tormented him. So in other words, man must possess the righteousness of God within himself. We must have inherent righteousness within us, just as we possess faith. Faith is our own, so must righteousness be our own, he believed. God requires inherent righteousness. Because of this understanding of the righteousness of God, Luther associates that with the gospel. The gospel is the righteousness of God, as he sees in Romans 1, verse 16, and that's the standard that God requires that man can never live up to. So Luther now hates the gospel for imposing this impossible standard on humanity. He says, but I, blameless monk that I was, felt that before God I was a sinner with an extremely troubled conscience. I couldn't be sure that God was appeased by my satisfaction. I did not know, love, no, rather I hated the just God who punishes sinners. If that's the gospel then he hates God because God requires something that no one can live up to. The monks, of course, would go to confession, just like the laity, the doctrine of uh, the sacrament of penance. And again, just as many of the monks didn't take their vows seriously, they also didn't take their confession of sin as seriously as Luther did. And they didn't take the confession seriously because they didn't take their sin seriously. And so many of the monks would confess things like, forgive me for coveting when I saw that Brother Matthias had more time to pray than I had. Things like that. Really, it's like a humble brag sort of thing. That's not real confession. But Luther took it seriously because he took his sin seriously. And he was tormented by his sin. And therefore, he tormented his confessor, his father confessor, Johann von Staupitz. One time he confessed for six straight hours. He knew that if God required inherent righteousness, this righteousness within himself, then all of his sin had to be purged through the sacrament of penance. So he's searching every corner of his heart to find one speck of sin that's unconfessed. For hours before his confessor, then he returns to his room in the monastery and he's worried, what if I forgot something? What if I sinned on my way back to my room? And he would sometimes go back and confess more. And Von Staupitz is like, goodness gracious, <laughs> again? Never had assurance that he was right with God. Finally, he said, at last, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, I gave heed to the context of the words. Namely, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed, as it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. There I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous lives by a gift of God, namely by faith. And this is the meaning. The righteousness of God is revealed by the gospel, namely the passive righteousness with which merciful God justifies us by faith. As it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. He says, here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. There, a totally other face of the entire scripture showed itself to me. So he came to believe 
that the righteousness of God now is a gift of God to the sinner. God's still perfectly righteous, and he still demands perfect righteousness in order to be right with him. God doesn't lower the qualifications. Luther didn't come to understand that maybe God's righteous standard was not what he thought it was. No, it is. Absolute perfection. Instead, God provides that righteousness that he demands. So in Romans 3, 26, God can be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. As Augustine st said before, command what you will and grant what you command. God commands us to be perfectly righteous, and then he grants us that righteousness. This is the breakthrough. This changes everything. So question 60 then explains how we are righteous before God. The opening line there gives the short answer to this question, only by true faith in Jesus Christ. And then the rest of the answer explains all that that entails, only by true faith in Christ. What is true faith? We see earlier in question 21, faith is a sure knowledge and a wholehearted trust. Or as Westminster Shorter Catechism 86 says, faith is receiving and resting in Christ alone for salvation. So it's through faith that we obtain this righteousness of God. So again, righteousness is conformity to God's law. God himself is that standard of righteousness. And then third, we must be clear that we make a distinction between legal righteousness and evangelical righteousness. So legal righteousness is the fulfilling of the law by an individual who then is declared righteous. So someone perfectly obeys the law. This is legal righteousness. Based on that perfect obedience, he is declared to be legally righteous. This is inherent righteousness, righteousness of my own, legal righteousness. Well, who qualifies as legally righteous? Adam does before the fall. Adam was legally righteous when he obeyed God's law up until that point when he falls into sin. And of course, Christ in the incarnation is legally righteous. As a man in his human nature, he perfectly fulfills God's law in every way. And he is declared righteous. Who else? That's it. No son of Adam is legally righteous. So if we're counting on legal righteousness, we're in trouble. Galatians chapter 3, verse 9. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. So every son of Adam is still under the covenant of works. Every son of Adam is required to possess this legal righteousness, this internal inherent righteousness. And they will be judged for not measuring up to God's perfect standard. God doesn't grade on a curve. It's not just our good outweighing our bad. We must abide, as Galatians says, by all things written in the book of the law. Not most things, not more than not 51%. All things. One mistake deserves infinite condemnation. So it's hopeless to rely on our own works of the law. Therefore, because none of us can attain legal righteousness of our own, God provides evangelical righteousness, a righteousness of grace. Evangelical, not referring to 21st century American evangelicalism, but evangelical in the strict sense of grace, gracious righteousness, the evangel, the gospel. And this is the fulfilling of the law by another in our place. So Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. It's credited to our account through faith. So again, legal righteousness is our own righteousness. It is earned righteousness. Evangelical righteousness is a gift, a gift of grace imputed to us. Luther, of course, spoke of evangelical righteousness as alien righteousness. It is foreign to us. It is outside of us. It doesn't belong to us properly. We don't possess it of ourselves. It comes from outside of us. It comes from without and it is graciously granted to us. 
Now, even though we know our justification is entirely the work of Christ, we contribute nothing. The only righteousness that we have is Christ's righteousness, this alien righteousness. Sometimes we can slip into thinking that sanctification is entirely our work. We'll talk about this more next week, Lord willing, Lord's Day 24. But most of us are not really tempted to take justification into our own hands. There are some who are tempted to do that, but some of us are tempted to think that remaining in a right relationship to God is up to us. We know God brings us into right relationship with him, justification, solely by his work, by grace alone, through faith alone. But then maybe we can tend to think that remaining in that place involves our work. We see this with the federal vision, which was condemned uh, by Reformed churches uh, in the last decade. They say that we enter into the covenant of grace by God's sovereign decree, but then we remain in that covenant by our own faithfulness. So God gets you in by grace, but then you have to stay in through your own faithfulness. And then there is a final justification where our entrance into heaven is based upon not Christ's righteousness, but our own righteousness. And maybe some of us won't go that far, but we might tend to think that our status as Christians in God's favor is somewhat dependent upon us as if we can fall out of God's good grace. Of course, we strive to mortify our sin. We strive to live in obedience out of gratitude. But God is just as sovereign in sanctification as he is in our justification, as he is in our glorification. God is sovereign throughout the order of salvation. So it's not as if God elects us and calls us and gives us faith and repentance and justifies us and adopts us, and then it's up to us to remain sanctified. He's sovereign over all of it. And who empowers us to do these things he's called us to out of gratitude? Mortify sin, live in obedience? He does. He gives us the power to respond out of, grace, out of gratitude for his grace to us. So we shouldn't fear that we'll make shipwreck of our faith. Because God is in control of our salvation from beginning and end. So justification then is a forensic judicial decree. It is forensic in that it is a legal matter. We, we see shows like CSI now, forensic science and so forth. It's legal matter. It's judicial. It's enacted by a judge or a court, in this case God. And it's a decree. It is a declaration from him. The ground... The basis of our justification is Christ's merit alone. We see this in question 61. Why do you say that through faith alone you are righteous? Not because I please God by the worthiness of my faith, for only Christ's satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness are my righteousness before God. I can receive this righteousness and make it my own in no other way than by faith alone. So this is Christ's active and passive obedience, his active obedience as he obeys the law in every way on our behalf, his passive obedience as he suffers for us. All of this is imputed to us. It is credited to our account. We contribute nothing to our justification. We don't even contribute faith. Faith itself is a gift. We get no credit for any of this. It's entirely based on Christ's righteousness. Again, for Christ's satisfaction, righteousness and holiness are my righteousness before God. All of it is founded on Christ's work. So justification is forensic judicial decree. The ground is Christ's righteousness, his merit alone. And third, the instrument of justification is faith alone. Faith is a gift. Faith is an open hand that receives the gift that God gives to us. It's all of Christ. We contribute nothing. Luther said, the only part I bring is my sin. All of Christ from beginning to end. From election to glorification from eternity past to the age to come, it's all entirely at work of the triune God. So we should be grateful and take great comfort in that.